How do you finance these strategies? So this is a big, uh, a big thing. So when you go out to get a loan to buy a house, you don't have a home. It's the easiest time as your first time. Uh, it does tend to be um, seem like a big deal because people have never done it before. But that's really the easiest place to get a loan. It's basically mortgage financing is a commodity. Uh, the lenders all get their money from the same place. We need somebody who has the ability to put it in place together with the right loan and that kind of a thing. But when you're building portfolios, it's a completely different sport. The majority of loan officers don't do apartment building financing. The majority of loan officers don't build portfolios where we have three, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 15 mortgages. And so at the Wong Group, we go to some efforts to develop relationships um, with lenders who have the ability to help manage that portfolio of mortgages because that becomes just as much of a part of your um, investment uh, portfolio as anything else. So there's a difference between good, bad, good debt and, and bad debt. We've talked about that. Uh, we've talked about uh, refinancing and harvesting equity and balancing assets. Good debt, very simply put, is money we borrow for um, creating more wealth. It's simply that. We encourage people to use debt to manage their tax liability and build their net worth. Bad debt is money that's borrowed for the purpose of consumption. For example, going on vacations, you can't afford to pay on a credit card and then you have that payment. Yeah, there's a saying that if you can't keep up, you can't catch up. So if you can't afford to do something, you borrow money to do it anyway, you better have a plan to pay it off. Otherwise, you're just going to have an insurmounting level of debt. That limits your ability to borrow, limits your ability to invest. So whenever we're talking about acquiring new debt, we're talking about good debt, which is going to basics in the end, but just in a larger scale. So we'll use an example of a qualifying income of $120,000 a year, $10,000 a month. It makes it easy for an example. We'll assume a debt to income ratio of 45%. This is what the lender will uh, allow the debt ratio to go to. And your debt ratio has to do with your, your house payment, principal interest taxes and insurance, PITI, plus anything like consumer debt, like your car payment, uh, student loan payment, minimum payment on the credit card that you might carry a balance on, that type of a thing. I've seen very high debt uh, ratios approved, particularly with some government programs. Um, and I've seen some more conservative lenders be a little bit lower, but 45% is the most common. So all your consumer debt, whether it's your house or car payment gets built into there, your taxes and your insurance for your real estate, your, your homeowner's insurance tells us that if we take 45% of our month, gross monthly income, and we subtract our consumer debt, that tells us how much we'll have left over for a house payment. Go to the next slide, please. So in this example, 45% um, of 10,000 is 4,500 a month. Let's say they have consumer debt of uh, 500 a month in a car payment. We're gonna assume that the real estate taxes will be 746 a month for this property. The insurance at $84 a month. And if we run those numbers, we subtract from 45, that 500, that gets us down to 4,000. We subtract the 746 and the 84, that leaves us at 3,170. Now, interest rates move every day, but let's say we have an interest rate uh, of 5.5%, that would give us a loan amount of 558,306. What kind of income qualifies? Um, virtually any type of income. The issue is how long does it have to be seasoned? So contractual income, like a salary, um, is much easier to do because you have a contract with your, your, your boss and company, what have you, and they're paying you exactly what they say they're going to pay you. Um, but we can use hourly, we can use commissions, we can use business profits, we can use seasonal employment, all that kind of thing. But if it's not contractual, then it typically has to be seasoned over two years. Okay, go to the next slide. So 
let's talk about that ratio. We said about 45% is the most common. Uh, we can go a little higher, a little lower, but that's a really good um, example. So just bear in mind at 120,000 a year, that's 10,000 a month, that's 4,500 a month for debt service for all of your consumer debt. There's not a lot of flexibility in this simply because lenders realize that if your debt structure gets too high, it's very hard to, to stay afloat financially. The only exception to that is as incomes get very, very high, we can get that ratio higher simply because basic cost of living, you know, a Chevy pickup doesn't cost more for a millionaire than it does for somebody who makes less money, right? A hamburger doesn't cost more for a wealthy person than somebody who's not wealthy. Uh, but 45% is a good number to use. Um, and what, bring, what, what, what gets qualified into that, again, we mentioned it really quickly, but you have to be careful because what we really encourage, the most powerful thing investors can do is not get a lot of consumer debt. We want to use your debt to income ratio for qualifying for income producing real estate. But here's where we see people get into situations that limit their, their, their abilities. They get higher auto loans, credit cards that they carry balances on and don't pay off, student loans, um, any kind of contractual debt. The issue is, is can you not pay it? Then it doesn't count typically. That's a good rule of thumb. If you have to pay it, then it typically counts as consumer debt. So the house payment itself, you can make, you've got your 45% of your income, your debt to income ratio, you subtract your consumer debt, the rest can be used for a house payment. House break payment is broken down into PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance. Principal is the amount, paying back the amount of money you owed. Interest is paying interest on the amount of money you owed or you borrowed. Uh, the taxes are your real estate taxes and your insurance is your property hazard insurance. Now, in this same example, same income, we're going to go ahead and um, our takeaway is considering reducing or eliminating consumer debt to make more borrowing power available for real estate and mortgages. Example, at a 5.5% interest rate, $1,000 a month in consumer debt reduces your, buying, your borrowing power in the terms of getting a mortgage by over $176,000. So let's take a owner occupied typical mortgage. This person just going out and buying a house. They make 4,500 a month. Um, they've paid off their debts. They don't have any car payments, that type of a thing. We'll assume that their taxes and insurance are 826 a month. So we subtract 826 from the 4,500, which means they can spend $3,674 a month for principal and interest at five and a half percent. That is $6,647,071. You add your down payment to that, and that's what your purchase price would be.